Am I manage managing video or am I managing the capability of our company to interact and interface and deliver a high quality of customer experience and user experience? And then how do I do that? And how have I leveraged the likes of data centers, be they public, cloud, um, remote, whatever they may be hosted, whatever type of data center that you feel is appropriate that hosts the application that you require to be able to deliver the service to the user that's required to be able to make sure that you're transacting in an effective, positive, uh, high quality way that brings that user, that client back into your business again. So ever before COVID, the world was changing dramatically. Now, what actually happened? What happened is everything then was disrupted. So if we can move to the next slide, that, that would be great, Paul. So everything was absolutely disrupted. And you know, I'll give an example of what that disruption looked like just from a personal perspective. I'm with Cisco 21 years. I stopped traveling at the beginning of February last year. By the end of February, I had been home longer in one stretch than I had been for the previous 20 years. I'm still at home. I'm still talking to you from my home office. So for 12 months next week, I have been working from home. So everything has been disrupted. How do I do my job? How do I communicate? How do I interact? How do I interface? How do I inform, you know, how do I influence? How do I make sure that my business is moving in the direction it needs to move? Well, actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll give you some examples of what organizations and executives in organizations are actually thinking about in terms of how we drive this new norm. Because we are in this new norm, we will never go back to what we've done before. The new norm is where we are now and where we're going forward. What it's actually done is that it's accelerated organizations uptake and focus on digitization by two years. That's true, by two years. So will I go back traveling again? Yes, I will, right? Because my job is an EMEA wide job, um, but not everybody has the same type of role I have. What will happen is that organizations will leverage technology to deliver flexibility into their clients, their communities, their staff, their supply chain, in terms of how they, they execute their roles. And at times, you know, there are surveys that will indicate that people working from home are significantly more productive than people working in, uh, in a home office or in the office, should I say. The other thing that organizations are looking at is security. So now we've went from maybe having a number of locations to having thousands of locations. So all of a sudden you've increased the risk profile and Martin's gonna talk a lot about how Talos in our organization significantly enhances our ability to deliver embedded security across your total networking topology across your organization. But looking at how people are, our organizations are securing not just their data, but your data. So you need to have people who have a strong level of peace of mind that coming onto your network, that their data is going to be protected and anything to do in the interaction with you is secure. The other thing I think what organizations are looking at, and you'll see here by the scores, is that resiliency is a key factor in terms of how they're now looking at building out their networking topologies and their IT investments across their organizations. But if you look at the total technology investment, what are we actually doing? How are we delivering that service? Because we've gone from, oh my God, I need to connect people urgently and quickly. And let's just get us people connected. And we worry about the user experience later on to, right, we now have everybody connected. Next problem is security. Is everybody secure? Are we making sure that uh, they have access to the right applications? The applications are flowing across your networks in an appropriate timeline so people can be productive, but is everything secure? Is the application secure? Is the application that's encrypted secure? Do the characteristics of that encrypted application maybe denote that potentially there's malware in there. How do we how do we define it? How do we measure that? How do we see that? How do we ensure that then that as users connect that they're secure? So there are a number of critical uh, factors that organizations and IT leaders such as yourself have to be very mindful. But therein lies another challenge if we move to the next slide. There is a significant 
lack of technology skill sets in the marketplace. And I'm going to take you back to um, 1999 when I joined Cisco. And I joined Cisco because there was a market transition called convergence, voice, video, uh, integrated data on the one network. And we talked about the facility people and the voice people had to really understand data and data people really had to understand voice and video because it would become a natural part of how they do business. We're now saying the same about security. Security needs to be an embedded capability in the network, within the network, not bolted on top of the network. Therefore, your organization's IT people need to become very comfortable and very capable around security and the network and how we deliver that service. But the challenge is IT skills professionals. And 70% of IT people have not mastered the skills that they will require for their jobs as those jobs evolve. And I've just given you an example of how we see these jobs evolve. But then the other challenge is the quantity of IT skilled people coming out of university versus the quantity of new roles available per year. There's thousands in the difference. How do you, how do you manage that as an IT professional, as an IT executive. Well, you need to ensure that you're delivering a topology and a network platform which is secure, which is scalable, and which is automated, but also has the ability to have significant levels of insight. So what are you able to see in terms of what happens across the network in the network and on the network. Um, AI and ML are critical elements in terms of how you deliver that and how you understand that. And, and Talos use a huge amount of AI and ML to be able to understand what's happening with applications in the internet. And Martin will speak a little bit about that shortly. But leveraging that to effectively move towards an autonomous network, a network that is almost self-healing. It is self-managing, it is self-checking and it is self-healing and looking at how you can do that is really, really important. So being able to understand, identify, remediate, exclude and permit applications depending on the severity of a potential threat or not is so important in terms of how you deliver a high quality of user experience to your users and into your organizations, both uh, your suppliers and also your customers, your complete supply chain. So leveraging a secure embedded networking platform in terms of how you deliver that is very important. And if we move to the next slide, I think it's, it's really important now that you as IT executives think about how you reimagine how you're going to build those as we move into 2021. The interesting thing, if we go to the next slide is, we're doing that for you. We are creating the tools, the technology, the innovation, and the capability for you to be able to deliver for your organization. We're going to talk about SASE in a minute, and we're going to talk about Talos, but SD-WAN has the capability from Cisco to be able to interface really effectively, not just into the networking capability and topology of your branch, of your remote location, of your campus, but, a, but able to manage the application flow across all of your remote links and how you decide to differentiate the traffic that needs to go back to corporate or out, break out immediately into the network and then how you secure that traffic in terms of how it gets out into the network and up into that application. So leveraging an SD-WAN capability from Cisco with embedded umbrella capabilities, the security that gives you, but also the capability of controlling the applications and the data that flows through your network in a secure way is unique in the marketplace. So as I mentioned, just to recap, we've gone from urgently needing to connect thousands of people in thousands of locations, and the requirement was just get us connectivity, to moving to once you got people connected to saying, how do I make this secure? It's really critical that we deliver a secure capability to everybody connecting to our network everybody connecting to our network. And lastly, now organizations are thinking about how do I create a topology 
that ensures that we have it right for the long term. Because as I shared with you, organizations are not just going to move back to how we did it before. It's about how we're going to do it in the future and having the correct apology for your network with a security embedded platform with capabilities that are enabling you to manage the insights, the assurance and the visibility and to make real time decisions instantaneously around the health and, and uh, performance of your network are really, really critical. So I've mentioned security a couple of times. I've mentioned TALAS a couple of times. I'm delighted to hand it over to Martin, who's going to go into minutia detail around how we do that and how we keep you safe and how we give you a good night's sleep in terms of how you're delivering for your organization and for your company. But before we go into that, um, I would just like to give you the results of the poll that we ran uh, at the start of the session. And would you believe 66% of you have said that user experience is now the main currency at a board level. And that's exactly what I'm hearing as I go out and speak to CIOs and CIOs right across Europe, Middle East, Africa and Russia. Um, so it is something that you need to be conscious of. You are becoming significantly more relevant at the board level and you are the, you are the head of the organization that's really going to drive the innovation and evolution of your company's success into the future. Martin, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ivan, and good morning uh, to everyone on the webinar. My name is Martin Lee. I'm uh, one of the technical leads within Talos, and I also have the pleasure of managing the Talos outreach team across EMEA. Uh, Talos is Cisco's threat intelligence and security research organization. Uh, what we do is follow the threat landscape, what the bad guys are up to, so that we can uh, identify their tools, their techniques, their malware, and make sure that we're protecting our customers against these kind of attacks, and also give uh, our customers the ability to uh, detect uh, when something wrong is happening or when bad guys are onto their network. So Paul, if we can uh, go on to the next slide. So the first question, uh, that really I think we have to think about is, uh, what do we mean by SASE? Um, it's a relatively new term. Um, it stands for Secure Access Surface, Surface, uh, Service Edge. And what it is, it's a way of thinking about the problems of how are we going to connect users and systems seamlessly and securely across internal and external networks. Um, in the old times, everything would be internal, everything would be on an internal network. We would have all our users within the office. Um, this is no longer the case. And uh, sitting in the middle, we have our security and IT teams who have to try and make this new world work where we have this mixture of internal systems, external systems, internal and external users and make everything work together. Next slide, please. Uh, why are we in this world? Well, we're, we're seeing the convergence of two, of two long-term trends. Uh, the first is that of cloud migration. Over the past 20 years or so, increasingly systems are moving towards a cloud adoption level. You don't need me to tell you that. Um, we have increasingly uh, software as a service, where we have specialized uh, organizations offering single functions that are, that are best of breed, and it's just easier and cheaper to have somebody else uh, uh, provide that to you than it is to do it in-house. So such as uh, things like email delivery, um, file sharing, financial systems, uh, expenses systems, all of these now are largely outsourced to, uh, to specialist providers. We also have that infrastructure as a service where the default in many companies, if you want to deploy a, a new piece of, so of software or make a new service uh, available over the web, well, we'll go to a cloud hosted system 
um, to, to deliver that. Why wouldn't you? Again, it's taking away some of that work uh, of administering these systems, backing them up, uh, plugging them in, keeping, keeping them uh, moving. It's far easier just to pay someone else to do that. This other trend which has been massively accelerated over the past year is that of remote working, as uh, as Ivan said. Um, I've been working um, partly from home, partly on the road, partly on the office for about 10 years or so. Um, as a very good example, uh, my wife, who's now working next door, working in finance, in healthcare, was told up until the end of February that it was absolutely impossible for her to do her job from home absolutely had to be done in the office, no other choice. And then the next week she was told, no, you've got to work from home. Um, so we have thousands, millions of people like that uh, across EMEA that are doing their job remotely for the first time ever. And again, as Ivan said, we're not going to go back to the old ways. Um, a lot of these people are now working from home for good or will be having a mixed way of working partly from home, partly from the office, partly uh, whilst traveling, and also from remote devices, not necessarily only from their um, work issued laptop, but also from mobile devices, from personal devices, from a mixture of the two. And we, these two trends are just going to keep happening. So we need to live with it. We need to think about what we need to do. Um, next slide, please, Paul. So what we want is to have a world where we have duly authenticated users um, who are authorized to use a system. They are accessing, accessing that system from a device which fits policy so that uh, uh, the IT teams and the security management know that this device is appropriate. That will be accessing the cloud uh, in some way and from then on going into this cloud, remote or hybrid internal external system. A very, very good question to ask yourself in engineering is to look at this um, ideal situation and ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong here? Um, in Talos, the way that we like to think about it is to think about things from a bad guy's point of view and think, what is, what is this world? What opportunities does it give the bad guys to cause harm or to be able to steal information or hijack users as part of this. Next slide, please. We can certainly, if we think about this from a bad guy's point of view, see a number of ways that we can attack this system. Maybe the simplest, and it's been with us uh, ever since we've had usernames and passwords, um, it's just to fish the user, um, send them some kind of message, trick them into divulging their username and password to our malicious threat actor who can then impersonate uh, that user and log on to that system uh, to which they're not authorized to access by impersonating a user. But that's only one way that we can subvert the system. Uh, another good one, if we get malware onto uh, the user's device, then uh, we can do things such as we can uh, intercept the username and password as it's being typed into the keyboard as a keyboard logger. Uh, we can even, uh, as we've seen in many uh, banking Trojans, put up a fake screen. So you go to your browser to this system, but in fact, you're actually talking to a malware, which is intercepting what you are seeing and what you are taking uh, or what you are typing into that system. Uh, we can also just uh, use our malware to steal information from that from the device. Um, that connection itself as it's made from the device into this remote system, we certainly want to know that that can't be intercepted, um, that it can't be uh, accessed in any way by the bad guy so that they can't read the data that is being transferred, but also that they can't inject data into that as well, which is something that we definitely, definitely need to, uh, need to present, we need to prevent. Next slide, please, Paul. Another way that we can interfere with this system maliciously is to um, either redirect our users uh, from accessing the legitimate system to accessing a malicious system and fool the user and fool their system into thinking that they're uh, connecting to the right system when in fact it's uh, an entirely illegitimate one. 
We've seen this um, recently with uh, sea turtle attacks where the bad guys have undermined the DNS system and also uh, uh, accessed um, otherwise legitimate X509 TLS certificates so that our user is actually uh, being redirected through illegitimate DNS to a malicious system, which is then presenting either a, um, a domain validated or indeed a stolen TLS certificate so that that connection authenticates. We can even, as the bad guy, interfere with the legitimate system itself. Um, if the bad guy is able to hack into this system and introduce their own malicious functionality, um, then again, they can interfere with that intercept uh, information and send back the wrong information to the users. We've seen this with uh, the cloud mage attacks, where because of the complexity of internet systems and the number of libraries that they uh, draw in, the bad guys have been able to include malicious software as a JavaScript plugin onto a web page and intercept uh, credit card and user details from those systems. We've also seen supply chain attacks where the bad guys are able to compromise otherwise uh, entirely legitimate pieces of software or libraries that are included in system. And again, make that functioning of the legitimate system illegitimate and malicious in some way. Next slide, please. The other thing that we need to think about are, are the propagation of threats. Um, if in terms of IT, we're trying to get internal and external systems working together seamlessly, we need to think quite, quite carefully, what is it that we mean by seamlessly and what would go outside of uh, what we would want to happen? We certainly don't want the wrong information being transferred in either direction. Uh, we don't want information which is confidential and which is protected and which the policy requirements for that uh, uh, data are that it stays on one particular system. We don't want that leaking into the wrong environment where it might not be uh, protected adequately. And we certainly don't want attacks and malicious content coming from our external systems internally. If you think back a, not, um, a few years to the NotPetya attack, uh, that particular malicious worm spread through the internet via internal connections. And uh, we saw systems and organizations where their internal security was actually very, very good indeed. Um, uh, however, they had connections with partners or suppliers, which uh, they trusted to have as good security as them, uh, didn't put the gateway uh, protections that maybe were necessarily in place. And when one of their partners or suppliers got hit with NotPetya, that then propagated internally across that um, entirely open internal network connection and started causing havoc, uh, causing havoc on the internal systems. Next slide, please, Paul. So we need to think about where we are now in terms of our SASE journey. Uh, this last year has seen absolutely heroic efforts from IT systems, um, IT departments across the world of getting people working remotely as quick and as fast as possible and getting people access to these systems. And for the vast, vast majority, they've been very, very effective and very, very successful in this. Um, at this point now, I think it's time to take stock. Um, is what we have deployed suitable? Um, is it something which meets our security requirements? And also to ask that key question going forwards, what could possibly go wrong here? And how can we prepare these uh, network topologies that we've deployed for future requirements, making them secure now and making them suitable for future work going forwards? And with that, I will thank you very, very much and hand you over to Paul. Great, thank you, Martin. Um, so um, just thinking about the point of making it right and understanding where we're coming from. So, so we talked about the fact that SASE is a journey and it's one that's going to take some time to get to uh, depending on where you are as a business. And, and different people are coming from various perspectives. I've referred to other industry transitions that we've seen 
time and time again um, around different teams having to work more closely together, like voice and data teams come together when that integration happens. And much like if we look at SASE, it's very similar in nature. There's a lot around security, connectivity uh, coming together for, for this transition. Um, so what's really sped it up is, is the climate that we've got, the ways that we're working. So effectively, uh, I'll step through some of the things that we're doing to help you get there further, you know, one step quicker uh, around that journey. So one thing that we wanted to do as well is um, it's good to get your feedback. So if you're on, on 24, you can uh, answer this poll. So going back to the point about many of you are coming from a different perspective. Some of you may be on the call from a, a more pure IT perspective. Some could be from a security background, applications background, etc. I think uh, all of your views are welcome from, from this perspective because they all form part of the future uh, SASE state. So it'd be good to get a view on the considerations uh, that you're making. You know, what's the key point that you think uh, is important to you uh, around SASE? Um, and the perspective that, that you're seeing it. And we've done a number of these sessions and depending on your role in the organization may depend on, on how you answer this, but it'd be good to con consider that and then discuss that as we go through the session and in the Q&A later on as well. So uh, please uh, feel free to, to jump on the poll and keep the questions coming. I know there's a number of coming few. We, we've got quite a few people in the background in the panel um, happily answering those as well. So uh, keep them coming in. So let's dive in a little bit more on the portfolio and where, where Cisco uh, plays in this, because many of you are Cisco customers, and thank you for that. Uh, you may have one or several components of uh, what makes up uh, SASE in, in many respects. And to be honest, going back to Ivan's point, this is something that we have been following uh, and leading as an architecture as, as well. So it's not new to us um, and there's various components that we've already been providing to customers as an architecture approach so if we think about left to right here firstly connectivity you know that change around connectivity whether, whether you're on-prem off-prem uh, completely mobile uh, we've been looking at that as as an area uh, for, for many years and one thing that, that is really important with that is, is how we embrace both private and public network infrastructures like the internet. So the SD-WAN portfolio uh, from Cisco has been doing that uh, already in helping customers integrate uh, those portfolios together. VPN has been around for a number of years as well in regards to how we, how we layer security uh, to that connectivity uh, for you wherever you're working from. And we, we many years ago looked at the benefits of having uh, both on-prem and cloud capabilities so we can help simplify how you deploy and use uh, connectivity with solutions like Meraki, uh, where we effectively push the management and control into the cloud also. So that simplifies the overall operational uh, aspects for you uh, as a customer and operator of this. If we think about security, again, security has always been something that's been embedded into all of these areas and typically customers may have looked at this as standalone uh, solutions may it be uh, a physical or virtual device uh, like for instance a firewall uh, may it be security controls that you put around applications as you moved into a SaaS -like solution like CASB may it be a, a security uh, web gateway uh, function as well as you use more internet services so these typically may have been budgeted or controlled through different teams uh, as security functions. But when we look at SaaS, we start to think about how can we pull those together and also push those up into cloud, much like the, the Meraki approach uh, in connectivity that I talked to. And one of the, the key things around security and protection, especially when we're all remote or mainly remote, um, as we found in, in recent times, is a density and access. And Martin touched on some of these points. What we found is it's very important to identify who's actually coming in, who they are, what they can use, what devices are on, what's the posture of, of, of that particular individual and, and what they're using. So this is really where we come more into that zero trust uh, approach where we, we're effectively saying we don't trust uh, anyone uh, that's coming in. We need to go for a number of steps 
uh, to take before we give access and, and uh, you know, to any of the data that we have and the applications. So again, some of the solutions you may have from Cisco in the areas of AnyConnect and Duo uh, are areas that, that are provided some of those capabilities. So from a perspective of Cisco, we're integrating all of those together uh, as we develop them, as we acquire organizations to, to build out this portfolio. That's the first thing we think about, simplicity, that user experience and, and ease of uh, kind of uh, integration there. And I'll touch on some of that as we go through. So we have this concept of connect, control, and, and converge. So if you think about connect, we don't really need to explain too much about that. That's an ease of connection wherever you are. We shouldn't care about where you're coming from, what device you're on, you know, who you are. Um, it should be transparent to you and easy for you. So, so that's the first uh, tick in the box, if you, if you like, around what we do. The control bit is, is key because identifying someone we need to know information about you we need to know potentially how we can identify who you are um, we need to know um, you know where you sit in the hierarchy of the organization if you're a contractor you're a mainstream employee what applications you should have access to depending on your job um, that workflow that's really important to, to understand uh, instead of kind of giving full access to everything because you're now in, inside the perimeter which is pretty much the old way of doing security and then that convergence piece is important. You know, it isn't just about security uh, and connectivity. We think about things like collaboration, uh, like the systems we're using here today, the fact that we're working from home for nearly 12 months in many respects, and we'll, that will continue. We need to have the right tools integrated from a collaboration point of view, maybe, you know, sharing of, of PowerPoint, maybe sharing of content, database information, whatever it may be, that, that convergence of all these systems together securely, but we're not impacting in, in how they, they're used. Some simple things that we've done on the connectivity side is if you look at the SD-WAN solution from Cisco, uh, Viptela has um, led, uh, you know, in the Gartner Quadrant, uh, many of the capabilities that our customers are, are looking and, and provide, uh, you know, that, that stepping stone to SD-WAN. And we've got, you know, a widely deployed infrastructure out there with customers of all shapes and sizes. And from a perspective of Umbrella on the other side with security, we've been doing a lot around protection of customers when they're accessing uh, key resources and going out to the internet. So right from simple uh, points of connection like DNS protection, so the first point of contact to the internet, right through now to the fuller capabilities of the Secure Internet Gateway where we're adding proxy services, firewall services and so forth. The first thing that people talk about is if, if I've got one solution or both solutions, how, how do I have that ease of integration and setup and deployment and speed of, of uh, rollout. So the things that we've done there are, 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 you know, some simple integration points to help you. So from a perspective of uh, as soon as you deploy SD-1, there's already an awareness of the umbrella security solution. So as you roll that out, as you add sites, as you add users, you're already integrating the umbrella capability as well. So from a perspective of operation, that really simplifies that point. If, if you're in the network team or security team or you cross over both, that's making your life a lot easier in regards to that. If you're thinking about the ongoing maintenance control operation, the, there is the, the portal capability. So you can actually see um, the uptime, you can see the availability, the, the, user, uh, the usage of the system, both across the network and across uh, the security again. Uh, with, with these systems, it's fully integrated. And then on the commercial side in how you procure this, Again, it's a simple point of procurement as well. You're not having to worry about is, you know, do I need to work out how I buy the network component, how I buy the security component. Again, from a commercial perspective, we simplified that under what we call the DNAP uh, architecture approach. So again, those steps to taking, uh, you know, connectivity into security or security into connectivity, you know, we're making those integration points and this is available today. If we think about the wider the SASE play and, and those security controls that we layer on on top of uh, this as well. So, you know, many customers have already uh, invested in some level of security controls, typically, uh, you know, secure web gateway, on-prem, on off-prem proxy. So, again, that, that is integrated into this solution. So, we've got those, that, those capabilities there. So, we can think about filtering control. Uh, of, of the, the users and applications. 
You think about the firewall side as well. You know, typically um, firewall would have maybe sat in a physical device and we can now elevate that and start pulling that up into, into the cloud. So this is a cloud delivered solution. So again, you can turn on these services as you need them, depending on who you are and uh, the user scenario. If we think about CASB as well, uh, CASB is really a tool that you can use to protect users uh, that are, are accessing SaaS services. The, the key thing here is about monitoring and protecting against data leakage. So if there's particular, particular uh, critical data, uh, user data, uh, personal data that you want to make sure that you're controlling and people aren't putting into uh, SaaS, uh, different SaaS applications that they're using, we can put that protection around, uh, around that with CASB. We can automate that to avoid data leakage as well. So, you know, in some cases, users, depending on their roles, you know, they may accidentally share something that they shouldn't. Again, we can automate that through the CASB uh, piece as well. And that threat intelligence covers all of this. So Martin and his team, uh, the wider Talos team, that integration is across one or several of these portfolios. So we're continuously updating that threat intelligence, taking it from the various points that we get it, understanding what it means, and then pushing that back to update uh, all of uh, these parts of the security layer as well. So network is always important for Cisco. You know, we've come from that and, and a security background. And integrating that into whether it's a client, whether it's a physical device, you know, from our perspective, we do that across the range as well. So you should expect this integration irrelevant of the type of user or uh, services you're using. So linking that to the, the next level of platform, something that we announced last year, which was um, SecureX. Um, the aspects that we, we hear from our customers, again, you know, we're simplifying that operational state. We're helping customers understand how to operate, maintain, scale out these types of services. But security is always quite a critical point where maybe you haven't got all of the on-prem resources around that security intelligence. You know, how can we give you that security intelligence without you having to have a lot of people operating in that domain within your own environment. Can we automate how we update that? Can we simplify that? So can we take that Talos information, that feed? Can we take the information that we're getting from your devices, from your infrastructure, from your people, and actually consolidate that into, into a single pane of glass? So really, that's where SecureX comes into it as well. So this is a cloud-native platform. Uh, it takes telemetry data from various points, you know, endpoint, network, uh, cloud devices, applications. It can integrate into third parties as well. So if you've got other integrations that, and, and investments that you've made that you want to bring into this, then we can do that as well. And um, if I'll put some links out later on and you can get further information about how we link into other third parties as well as that. So something that, that comes up quite readily. But the key thing here is we're trying to reduce the time to detect and the time to respond to security threats within your environment. And having that workflow automated, having steps that you can take uh, by using SecureX, we found that customers can reduce that dramatically. So if you've used solutions like uh, Cisco Threat Response in the past, this is kind of the next level up. So really, we, we find our customers uh, are very engaging on this. It's quite simple to deploy and you get that, that quick response, you know, whether you've got one or several uh, Cisco uh, security solutions or network solutions as well. From a perspective of kind of moving it through to what about the user, what about the workplace? Because the reality is, is that, you know, we're going to have working environments. There's still going to be manufacturing shop floor environments, pharmaceutical environments. It's not just remote working, right? So we need to think about how do we think about zero trust from the perspective of these different environments? So we've simplified that again further with the terminologies that we're using. So we think about this from a workforce, we think about this from a, a workload perspective, and we think about this from a, a workplace perspective. So let me just uh, touch on that from, from how we look at that. So from a workforce perspective, there's a number of components that we, we've provided and provided integration around. And so this is around how we can perfect you, uh, protect you uh, where, you, where you're on the move, whether in uh, office or, or, or on the move. So we've talked a little bit about those solutions that we've got from the cloud like Umbrella, cloud delivered. So it's very simple. We can turn on one or several services to help tailor and layer up the security and connectivity that you've got. Um, if you're an existing AnyConnect user, we can integrate into that very easily uh, as an example. So if you're on a VPN and we can add to, to that capability. Um, if you're using solutions like Meraki, again, 
we integrate uh, directly into that as well. So whether there's kind of a hybrid solution you've got or traditional uh, outright solution, uh, that's there. If we look at the workload, this is where we start talking about those workloads sitting in basically on-prem or, or off-prem cloud environments. So it could be a mixture of AWS, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft type of environments. And we think about those workloads, that data actually transferring between those environments to you as the user or between those environments because it's actually a workflow that's been uh, done in regards to access to database solutions, if it's access to CRM solutions, etc. The way we look at that is we want to protect that workload. So we, we want to do things like segmentation to ensure that specific systems should be talking to each other and that's secure, but make sure they're not talking to other systems that they shouldn't be talking to. So doing some elements of segmentation. Looking at things like the characteristics of, of that, that communication between systems as well. If we see something that is amiss, that shouldn't be happening, how do we alert on that report and that lock that down? So this is thinking about those workloads that are critical because we may be mixing environments as well where we start thinking about mixing in the workplace that IoT environment and the enterprise IT environment. But we might be using similar infrastructures, but we still want to keep that segmentation and control as well. So, so we think about it could be external factors of where some of these uh, workloads are sitting outside our control. So we need to have that visibility and control. So things that you may have heard from in the past, like Stealth Watch is integrated into this workload solution. So that can sit in the cloud and protect it, whether it's in AWS uh, environments, where it be Microsoft environments, Google environments, or we come back into the workplace, then we can start looking at that protection on-prem as well, where we start extending that through the network as well. So uh, from our perspective, you know, we're agnostic to, to where a workload with me may be, where a user may be. That's our approach to, to the integration in these different types of environment. But the thing here is we want to give you that, that visibility, we want to give you that control and to give you the ability to put those policies in place. If we think about how this comes together um, on, on kind of this journey and looking at some, some core principles. So thinking about the, the people attending this today and thinking about the experiences that we're having with, with customers globally, and especially within Amir, where myself, Martin and Ivan are focused. Um, we're, we're working with customers daily on, on providing guidance on you know, if we're coming from a network point of view, what are the first steps that we can take to integrate some of these security services? For instance, some of the security services may be on-prem, they may be physical in nature, and you're looking to make those steps to the cloud. So again, we can help with those steps as well. So taking an on-prem approach to a cloud approach, maybe virtualizing that instance and putting it into uh, an AWS or an Azure type of environment with Cisco, or may it be taking it as a service from a true cloud solution on it like Umbrella. Um, we're helping customers understand those steps. And in the same way we think about connectivity, how do we ensure that the workforce um, has seamless connectivity and we optimize that with uh, the connectivity that's available there, both public and private with the SD-WAN type of solutions with the uh, any connect type solutions and so forth. So if we look at this, we, we think about that as that, that layer below, um, but we're thinking about that threat and that landscape to ensure that we're always protecting uh, you as the user base. So if we look at um, uh, kind of next steps that you can take, I think the key thing for us is we do have expertise in uh, providing guidance uh, around uh, taking those steps. We've got uh, best practice guides uh, that we can share with you that you can access as well. So we've got uh, under the blogs page, we provide um, uh, guidance on some of these areas in, in the different areas that both Ivan, Martin and myself have discussed. And our team can follow up after this. Um, if you request uh, an engagement with us, we can look at that SASE uh, readiness review with you and think about that, that architecture steps that you can make. So from a perspective of this, you know, there's, there's various business benefits in doing this. You know, Ivan talked about that question at the beginning around your experiences of, you know, at the boardroom, what are they talking about? They're talking about user experience. They're talking about running the business, how we can simplify what we're doing. You know, as practitioners in security and IT in those areas, we can provide that guidance. They're looking for that guidance as well, and we can help work with you on that. So from a perspective of the poll that came in earlier, I wanted to talk through that as well. So um, it looks like it's quite a mixed bag on this around key considerations moving to SASE in your organization. 
Um, so from a perspective of, first of all, I think there's a strong f focus of how can you combine connectivity and security. So that was 51%. Uh, so again, I think a, the, the, the webinar today was targeted at the right audience. So it was very much at that kind of audience of people coming from connectivity and security background. So uh, again, that is the first point that we think about, you know, how can we do that in a se seamless manner? Actually next, uh, which was interesting again, and we do hear this a lot, especially from a securities perspective is visibility and control. So, you know, from a perspective of this landscape that's changing, if where users are coming in from how we're rolling out the services, how do we still gain that visibility and control? So I touched on that a little bit around, you know, things like SecureX, so we can look at aspects around uh, the actual uh, threats and the intelligence that we're getting from the information from the network, from connectivity, from security, so you can get that real-time view. But again, there's also the controlling elements as well, where you can actually push down policies, where we're talking a bit about, you know, segmentation and those kind of things that are, we're seeing customers doing to ensure that the right applications are talking to you, each other and there's no uh, mishaps of data leakage and other, other things happening as well. But they, they seem to be the, the, the top two. And then the, the, the third one around um, uh, complexity and working from home, thinking about how can we continue to evolve that solution. And that comes back to the fact that um, if we actually looked at what we did first, we, we, we rushed into making sure we've got connectivity for users so we can run, keep running the business in the early parts of the pandemic. Then we kind of looked more closely at how that is secured. And now we're looking at more, you know, how do we have a longer term validated solution that is you know you know scalable and fit for purpose for the future sake so that was the next one that i think you you called out as well so so some really good points there and and thank you for that um i know the questions have been answered as we've gone through the session uh today um i just wanted to quickly go around and see if there was any other points or last uh key call outs from uh, my other esteemed speakers uh, on the call today as well. So I'll lean over to Ivan first, just to see if you've got any other points, Ivan. No, no, just an offer. Uh, my email address is id at cisco.com. If you've any questions or want to follow up, please just drop me a note. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. And then over to Martin. I think I'd reiterate your um, your point, Paul, that uh, visibility is key. Um, if you don't know what you've got, you can't protect it. So being aware of what is actually happening on your on your network, both good and bad, I, I think really is key to understanding the problem and then taking steps to solve it. Thank you, Martin. And for me, we're, we're here to help, you know, uh, quick call out on, on this again, go to the blog, some really good information there that help direct you and request a, a follow up with one of our practitioners. We can help you around that SASE uh, readiness. And also in case you're looking out for it, we would have normally had Cisco Live uh, Amir happening in the next week. Uh, we've pushed that out uh, to later on in the year, but that's definitely coming up and that will be fully virtual. So uh, we've been looking forward to, to seeing, you at, seeing you there attending that event where we do cover off a lot around best practices like this from uh, key uh, architects within our teams and other uh, business leaders within Cisco as well. So thank you for attending today. Uh, we look forward to continue to working with you as we go through 2021. Uh, stay safe and we hope to see you again. Between Sri Lanka's lost girls and a future full of opportunity, there's a me tank. Growing up, I always wanted to be helpful. I was inspired by my mother and how she helped my community. My mom would cook a lot of Syrian food. One day, she asked my brother and me to deliver meals to our neighbors in need. She taught me that when you help others, anything is possible. Even leaving my country to pursue a degree. When I landed, I was shocked to see the level of poverty. I thought, how could such a wealthy country 
waste so much food when so many people are worried about their next meal? I heard my mother in my ear, and I knew what I needed to do. I started taking surplus food that would otherwise be thrown away and giving it to those who would benefit from it. I could see the tremendous impact right away. I recruited some smart students, and with Cisco's help, we were able to build an automated platform to connect food donors to communities with food insecurity. Not only are we putting good food to use, but also can track the positive impact on the environment. With sharing Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future, we've been able to provide over two million meals across the U.S. My mother is my real hero. She taught me that a delivery so small could one day deliver on something so much bigger. Between a small gesture and a huge impact, there's a bridge. My name is Roy Vessel. I've been at Cisco for 12 years. Outside of Cisco, I work in teaching cybersecurity and cyber defense to youth through a program called Cyber Patriot and through the United States Air Force Civil Air Patrol. I took the team over and fell in love with it. We start at the age of 12, work all the way through high school. I want them to know how to take care of themselves and protect their information, protect themselves, protect their families. We've got kids that have graduated through my program that are now working for the government. Uh, I've got folks that are working in corporations looking for cyber threats and how do we prevent them. Cisco's been heavily involved. If you have something that you have on your heart um, or passion that you want to reach out and do, talk to your manager. The satisfaction of seeing uh, these kids grow, uh, seeing those light bulbs go off, that's my payment. Between curious kids and the future of cybersecurity, there's Roy Vestal. Greatness accepts no lag, no delay, no excuses. It lives in the tiny space between milliseconds and nanoseconds, between memes and legends, between tears and tears. And when margins that small make an impact this big, nothing less than the speed and dependability of the Cisco network will do. My name is uh, Lucy, uh, it's uh, my English name. A Chinese name is Xiu Fan. I come from Beijing, China. Uh, I have been uh, working in Cisco for 19 years. I'm a sales manager in customer experience team. I think Cisco is really a great company. Cisco support us giving back live days. We have some energy. We, we have the eager from 